about the film Deception, I, I mean distribution. <laughs> As you know, I don't know if you know or not, but I've I've become a, 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 a kind of like a a, a a warrior for film yep. distribution. I I want to help filmmakers navigate this ridiculous system that is film distributors. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the system, what's wrong with it, how can it be fixed, your, your horror stories, all that stuff. Well, you know, uh, and that's the chapter in my book, uh, film deception. I mean, distribution. I think is what it's called. And <laughs> exactly. You're right. And it's you know, I've been involved with some some big indies that were like million, two million dollar indies that had deals, and nobody's made any money, nobody's seen money, and they go in and they audit and they find out the film's made three million dollars, and oops, sorry, I missed that. You know. Um, I think you have to realize that it's hard because you, as a filmmaker, you got you create a product, you raise the money for it. As you say, you cast the crew and then you cast the film, you know, the actors, you go through the brutal process of making, you go to war, let's be honest, making a movie is war. And then you kill yourself in post and then you get it done. And then you entrust it, you entrust it to somebody to sell. And I, you know, unfortunately you will never know the true numbers that a movie makes or doesn't make. Um, and I think you have as I say in my book, what I always try to say is try to find a group that will capture the vision early on. I, you know, everybody has that envision of, well, I'm going to just throw it up and let the bidding wars begin. It doesn't work that way anymore. It's not, it, the, ni it's not the 90s it's not and the we're not at Sundance dream. then. <laughs> it's, not, it's not, you know, hoop dreams. It's, you know, come on. So what I always suggest <laughs> is really try to develop relationships with with distributors that have got longevity. You don't want somebody who just fell off the turnip truck or a guy who's running a company who was part of a company for two years and part of a company six months before that. You know, there's some good companies out there that are tried and true. Mm -hmm. Just know going in they're they're all going to have their creative accounting. And But stop all... right there. For, so stop there for a second. I just want to, okay. I want to touch on that. Sure. And this is what I've been yelling about from the top of the hills. There is a, it's a systemic problem in that side yeah. of our business. It has been going around since the days of Chaplin, which is yeah. called creative accounting. I yeah. feel that it is as prevalent as the casting couch was prior to the Me Too movement. Like the casting couch was a, it was just like, you all heard it like, oh yeah, you have to go on the casting couch if you want to get the part or you oh, heard yeah. of this of this casting couch. And when I was in film school, you heard about that. And it was even joked about in, in movies and stuff. It was just yeah. part of, the way movies were made until finally that that horrible cycle was broken. I yes. feel that the same thing is happening on a financial standpoint in the distribution side where, oh, there's, and I love the way you just said it, like, oh, there's going to be creative accounting. Why? There's no other industry that I know of, like the cookie business. If you if you make a cookie, you sell a cookie, you send it over to the, the supermarket, the supermarket's got, like, th there's no creative accounting in the cookie business. Why really? is it, right? So why is there creative accounting in our business and why okay. is that still acceptable in today's world? It's, well, the reason, sadly, it's acceptable is because, you know, you got 33,000 movies a year, Alex, being made <laughs> through SAG with at least what somebody deems a bankable act. OK, that's a whole sure. other discussion. But but people are beholden to investors or their wife if they wrote the check themselves and they got to get a film out. And distributors know how desperate us filmmakers can be. And they also know there's 54 territories on the globe, 174 buying countries. So, Alex, if I'm a distributor and I take your film and I know if I make a hip pocket deal in Guam, the chances of you going to Guam on vacation with your wife and staying at the, the Radisson and seeing it at two o'clock in the morning on Guam vision or whatever, you're probably not going to see it. And you're not going to know if I got five grand for it, 2,500 for it. So what happens is there's 54 territories. They're going to hopefully sell the biggies. You know, you may get somebody come in and buy up 20 territories. You may sell Germany, Southeast Asia, Vietnam, uh, China. But most of us filmmakers don't realize, and it's in my book, there's 54 territories. All those territories equally need content. What is What I believe keeps a lot of the smaller distributors awake and alive is those hip pocket deals they make at AFM, Toronto, Mitcom, Berlin, where they're like, look, I'll tell you what, you can have these 10 movies for 10 grand. You and I will never know about it. 
We just don't know about it. I mean, I've so, traveled the world and seen my films on TV years later. Like, I never made a deal here. And like, you know, like, seriously, I mean, it's happened. And that's, I think, and then there's also the charges, the market charges, you know, when oh. you have a they'll charge you up to $25,000. Then there could be a market overhead charge for another 25 plus anything that you don't have the money to do. You need a surround 5.1 surround fully filled M and E. Well, we didn't do that. I only had a few grand to mix the film and stereo. They'll gladly do it for you. So you have to be sure they're not charging you more than it should cost. Well, you mean like, you mean like $10 uh, per minute for cl of closed captioning? <laughs> yeah. Where <laughs> to do a 90 minute movie, should cost you more than $112. I mean, right. I remember, I remember doing a music video for VH1 for an artist. I won't say who. Mm. And um, <laughs> VH1 demanded, um, we did closed captions for their video. And I found a place that was for a music video, three and a half minutes. You've done a lot of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, closed captions for. No. Uh, what year for, was this? What year VH1. was it? What year, what year was this? Oh, it was like 2004. Okay, sure. Okay. Not, not a long time ago. They It was $582. <laughs> And I'm freaking Jesus now because I, I never like walked closed captioning through any of so I called a friend of oh. mine, Todd Gilbert, who used to run Avi Lerner's uh, post production. I love Todd. And I called him and said, Hey, buddy, I got a question. He's like, What are you out of your mind? Call this place in San Francisco. It's going to be like, it's it's going to be like no money. So the music video had cost me like $38. And right. I did the same company for my 90 minute movies. It's $112 for 90 minutes, all in. Exactly, and there's so many other options now as well. But so I love I love the term hip pocket deal because not many people understand what that is. And what you've basically explained is like they have your movie, they have worldwide rights. What they're going to do is they're going to call up uh, South Africa um, or even a smaller market, and you have a relationship with Guam. Let's say Guam, and they're like, "Look, I'm going to give you two thousand. <laughs> give me two thousand bucks for this film, and uh, and you'll never hear about it because you, unless you audit them, and even if you audit them." Good luck. And so but, that you have no power. You but are, that's get away from it. Don't, not to right. cut you off, the way they get away with it is they do the block deals. So there is no paperwork for that film. Oh, let's yeah, talk about packaging. Don't get, they yeah. Do a, they'll do 10 to 20 films for 20. It's 1000 to $2,000 per title. Take all these titles. A lot of people, I had a guy who came to me to help sell his film, and I, I befriended a former Scorn distribution guy. And he said, and I said to him, this guy's got insomnia. He's up at 2.30 in the morning watching Cinemax. He can't figure out how some of the worst movies in the world are on there and why his movie can't get on there. He goes, oh, I can get it on there tomorrow. We'll just have to package it with 10 to 20 others. He'll get two grand and it'll be on Cinemax in four months. He goes, because those deals are packaged, they don't show up. They just I'm sorry, but that's it. Not, not to throw Cinemax under the bus. Cinemax isn't doing anything wrong. It's the people peddling these package deals to these foreign networks and countries and ancillaries. It's just what happens. And there's also, don't forget the fire sales and yeah, there's fire sales as well. They're like, Oh yeah, here, I'll give you this movie for 500 bucks. Just, you know, here yeah. you go. And, and those deals are done at AFM. They're done at a con. They're done at they're, Berlin. Yep. And they're done online now, <laughs> yeah. but you're right. And, and where that comes from is a sales agent takes on a film. They can't give it away. It's a stinker. And they may have put together some artwork or a trailer and be out a few grand of liquid cash to their vendors to get it done. They need to start recouping. So what I always tell filmmakers is please, 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 please read the fine print. Read my book, because I actually copy and paste a lot of contract misleading language in that chapter of my book. I The, the way the book came about, I, I get a lot of calls from independent filmmakers for advice. I even get some calls from very well-known filmmakers for advice when they need to save a buck or two. And what, what happened was is I started writing a blog and they I said, hey, do you want to write a book? And then my wife was like, you know, you're giving a lot of time to people. Why don't you just, you keep, she goes, I've been listening to you do this for 20 years. You keep telling them the same thing. Why don't you just write your thoughts down and it's all in one place? And that's how the book became. And while I was writing the book, I had a really respected indie filmmaker who for the first time in their life was stuck. He raised over a million and a half dollars of his own, you know, of liquid cash, made a movie, got a couple of big stars attached and it was on his ass to sell his movie, to get distribution. He had no idea how to do it. He was a very good filmmaker with no business in distribution. So he starts sending me all these contracts and his investor wants him to sign this with this company. And 
I, that is when the light bulb went on for me, Alex. I went, oh my God, I gotta write about this. I have to take these documents and copy and paste them and put them in a book because these are so duplicitous and so misleading. People don't realize when they have a $20,000 market charge and then $20,000 <laughs> service charge, that's 40 grand that the movie's gonna make before you see a dime plus a percentage plus marketing costs of a trailer. Well, the trailer probably costs them a thousand to make. They're gonna charge you five grand. The posters cost them a few hundred. They're gonna charge you 1,500. That all gets back charged, dude. And then they're gonna take 20% on top of that as a commission. Oh yeah, but they'll take, don't forget, they take that 20% before all of those expenses. They make sure that, they, oh. yeah. Oh yeah, so if, you, if you're saying 100,000, that 20 grand goes right off the top. Then they start pulling out all the, yeah, it's yep, it is right. su it's such a, a scam, and I think that I mean my 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 second book, Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, it's about giving the filmmaker the power to take control of their own thing and.